today's uh, colloquium speaker is uh, Michael Daniel. Um, he's a, a scientist here at SAO. Um, he is the Veritas on-site observatory manager, and he's been with us for about five years. Um, and his position in Veritas is one of the most important and probably also one of the most stressful positions on the project. I mean, effectively the on-site observatory manager is on call uh, 24 seven, and he's been in this position for about five years. Um, so you can imagine he's gonna at some point need a very long nap. Um, and what does his job really entail? Well, not only does he supervise the technician, but he's really ultimately responsible for fixing everything. Um, so he knows a, a lot about the various hardware on the project, you know, much more so than I do. Um, but, you know, it, it really means that, you know, he's sort of a number one person that's responsible for keeping this thing running. And, you know, if you, you ask how well has he done? Well, I mean, if one thing I can tell you about Veritas is that it's always exceeded every sort of technical performance metric since, uh, you know, he's been on site. Um, and I'll just give you some comparison, you know, last year or the last, you know, full year that we operated Veritas, we lost less than 10 hours of telescope observation time due to technical issues. And to give you an idea, when we started this project, you know, we were losing about 100 hours a year when it was brand spanking new. And now Veritas is 15 years old. So to give you an idea of how well things are going with the project, technically speaking, and how well the job that Michael is doing out there, I mean, it, it speaks, you know, volumes about this, that we're, we're losing so little time. So, you know, Michael, uh, it, it, you know, comes out of the United Kingdom. Um, he, uh, you know, did his... Uh, pre-doctoral work at Leeds and got his PhD in Durham in about 2002, around about the same time I got mine. Um, and then he followed a series of postdoctoral uh, research appointments and fellowships with Iowa State, Dublin, Leeds, Durham, and Liverpool, you know, ultimately kind of starting out in the Veritas uh, line. And he was part of a Veritas construction, you know, building the camera, uh, doing some of the offline analysis software development. And I met Michael in about 2004 when he was a postdoc on Veritas, and I ironically was working on a Veritas competitor uh, called Hess. And so, you know, over time we got to know each other, drinking beers all around the world, and you know, became friends. Um, and uh, you know, at, at some point in time, I became you know a Veritas director, and at the same time, Michael realized it was a good time to to flee Veritas and join Hess. Uh, right when I joined Veritas, and so we crossed the seas, uh, worked on different projects. But over time, we both were involved in the CTA project, which is the next generation gamma ray observatory. And then eventually Michael came back to Veritas to come work with us again. Uh, Michael's interests in, in Veritas it started out in the, the particle astrophysics realm, doing dark matter, indirect dark matter searches, looking for potential Lorentz invariance violation and things like that. So less in the traditional astronomy sense of you know, looking at supernova remnants or AGN or things like that. Um, but one of the things that always kind of peaked uh, my interest is in Michael and using these gamma ray telescopes to do non-traditional things. I remember when we were in Munich in 2014, I started uh, grilling Michael about, you know, potential use of uh, Veritas for optical astronomy and the capability of our cameras for it. And that is really the, the source of this colloquium today is some of the great successes we've had in recent years. And Michael's been a large driving force behind this of using Veritas to do, I would say, you know, non-traditional optical astronomy. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Michael to present to you uh, some of our early results from this optical astronomy program with Veritas. Yeah, thank you, Winston. Uh, let me just bring up the screen. Okay. So yeah, uh, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, in simple terms, measuring small things with very big buckets, but really it's about what we can do for sub milli arc second angular resolution optical astronomy with the Veritas Observatory. I'll go into a few details as to why that's really a, like a remarkable thing to do with the sorts of telescopes that we have. So the outline is basically will motivate why we want that sub milli arc second scale uh, angular resolution uh, for there, and then go into how a gamma ray telescope is actually useful for getting those uh, with an emphasis on uh, eclipses, well, or more uh, occultations uh, and transits uh, and the intensity interferometry. But really it's looking at uh, a Cherenkov telescope where the science normally is right at the far end beyond the rainbow as it's poetically described in terms of supernova remnants, pulsars, binaries, active galactic nuclei, so like non-thermal emission and particle astrophysics aspects in terms of dark matter and Lorentz invariance. Uh, and seeing it's like uh, Cherenkov telescopes, the science can be in the optical astronomy regime in terms of eclipses and occultations, transits, uh, and uh, other things that I won't uh, touch on here in terms of like uh, optical SETI uh, and uh, fast radio burst counterparts and these sorts of things as well. 
So what is the motivation for the suddenly out second uh, astronomy kind of level? And a lot of it's driven by the fact that uh, our ability to understand something is quite often linked with our ability to resolve it as well. Um, and how well we can resolve something uh, will determine whether or not we see canals on Mars or just long dark furrows of uh, wasteland, uh, essentially, if you want to look at it in those sorts of terms. So if you look at the kind of angular scales of things, the sun and the moon are about 30 arc minutes, local planets, 30 arc seconds. The largest stars are in about 30 milli arc seconds, but typical bright stars, you're talking about one milli arc second uh, and less than that. And so if you look at the Rayleigh criterion for these, uh, most stars will only become resolved surfaces for telescopes of 100 to 1000 meters uh, in uh, diameter. Now, obviously the engineering of such things is incredibly difficult to do. So we have to look for uh, other ways around that, you know, it's like uh, imaginative ways uh, to engineer out this problem. And I'm gonna show you uh, two ways that we've gone about this. Uh, but uh, first I should probably bring uh, anyone up to speed uh, with what a Cherenkov telescope is. So normally uh, a Cherenkov telescope is based on uh, very high energy gamma ray astronomy, um, where we have uh, gamma rays of uh, TV and energy interacting 20 kilometers in altitude uh, in the atmosphere uh, and converting to uh, an electron positron pair, which generates more high energy photons, more electron positron pairs, and basically generates an air shower uh, within the atmosphere. Now, most of those particles don't reach the ground either. Um, they actually produce Cherenkov light because they're particles moving faster than the light can in the medium of the air. Uh, and that's producing optical light uh, around about eight to 12 kilometers above ground with an opening angle of around about one degree. So by the time this uh, optical Cherenkov photons reach the ground, they've stretched out into an area about the size of a football field. And by putting a telescope uh, anywhere within that area, uh, we've essentially got a detector, albeit indirectly, of very high energy gamma rays. Now the properties of Cherenkov light are that it's very faint, you know, one in 10,000 photons uh, is a Cherenkov photon compared to the night sky background, and they're very brief in around about a nanosecond. So we need very large detectors to collect as many of these photons as we can. And so a Cherenkov telescope is essentially a very large bucket looking at uh, air shower images, which are you know, a, deg a degree across or so, so several times the size of the full moon in size. Uh, this means that the Veritas telescopes, 345 mirror facets with about 100 square meters of collecting area, uh, and a very modest 0.1 degree po uh, point spread function. So at this point, people are th uh, thinking, so how is a telescope where one of our unique selling points are the modest optical qualities, we need to build very large telescopes for not very much money. Uh, how can these become useful tools for sub milliard second optical astronomy? So to understand this, we need to think a little bit about the, uh, the noise sources in astronomy because our ability to resolve something is how we can, much we can see the signal above the, the, the noise. And so you can uh, basically split these into three areas. Uh, the first part is the flicker noise, which comes from the source. We can't do very much about that. Uh, the second part is the scintillation. So that's the light tra traveling through the atmosphere. This is what limits the seeing uh, for most telescopes down to around about an arc second. Um, so you're not actually getting to the diffraction limit of uh, a mirror surface anyway. Uh, and then you get the shock noise, which is the number of photons that you're collecting at the ground. And that's your detector. Uh, a large light bucket, gives you very uh, good uh, shot noise capabilities, that sort of way. Uh, but there's also something we can do about the scintillation. And so what is this scintillation? It's essentially just turbulence in the atmosphere, which is acting like a lens. And that refracts the light travel path and causes flying shadows and bright spots in the same way that you see these light and dark patches in a swimming pool. You have light and dark patches on the ground from the light coming through there. And that can cause the light to be uh, to, to miss the mirrors of the telescope and not be reflected back into the detector, or it can cause it to be focused uh, and uh, so they give you bright and dark patches um, along there. And there are two ways that you can like, uh, counteract this. One is just to sit there for long enough that the number of dark patches and the number of light patches average out, or you can have a very large bucket as well, such that the light isn't scattered out of your mirror anymore, it's just scattered onto a different part of it. So when we look at these noise sources in optical astronomy, the shock noise um, is perhaps the, one of the lowest levels there. Scintillation noise comes to dominate it. And even though it's a part of the atmosphere, we can do something about this with the detector. Uh, 
obviously scintillation is a very complex process which depends on the wind speed the wind direction the altitude you're at the air mass that you're looking at whether you've got any central obscurations and sorry, tessellated mirrors and facets and, and things like that but what it break, boils down to is three different regimes there's a long exposure regime where the speckles traverse the pupil of the uh, of the instrument and you can reduce your noise by temporal averaging just basically having a very long exposure uh, there's a short exposure regime where the speckles actually just would be frozen um, and there's no temporal averaging um, that you get from here. Uh, and particularly if you're interested in um, uh, high frequency or uh, high uh, time resolution uh, astronomy, you're going to be stuck within that short exposure regime um, down to like, you know, time scales less than a second. Uh, but what it comes down to is the, the, the second thing, the size of your light bucket collecting. And so a one meter telescope will have a certain level of scintillation noise and a 12 meter telescope will have something which could be two to three orders of magnitude better. So if we boil it down to its simplest level, bigger equals better in terms of reducing that scintillation noise. Now, if bigger equals better, then Cherenkov telescopes should rank among the best source of optical telescopes that we have, just because they are very large like buckets in this sort of way. And in this picture, um, we've plotted uh, uh, all, all manner of uh, large telescopes uh, from uh, the Great Paris Telescope in 1900, uh, all the way up to the future instruments in terms of uh, GMT, the ELT, the TMT, and, and things like that. And we can see in the right-hand panels that Cherenkov telescopes rank among some of the largest optical telescopes in the world. Uh, and there's Veritas there with its four 12 meter telescopes. So in terms of photometric capability, there's a very uh, obvious, uh, uh, opportunity for the Cherenkov telescopes uh, to get in there, but how best to demonstrate this. So for doing that, uh, we come back all the way to the ancient Greeks. Uh, and one of the easiest things to do is have uh, people watching shadows projected on the wall from objects passing in front of a light source, and giving names to these shadows to understand the universe. Uh, in our cases, we call them eclipses, transits, occultations. But when it comes to a predictable, testable outcome, it really is very hard to be passing something in front of a star. So if you want to demonstrate the optical capabilities of a Cherenkov telescope, these provide us with a, a, a ready uh, form of science to do. So that one of the first things we did was to look at uh, an, an eclipse, uh, an eclipsing binary system. And so with z -Vol, we've got an Algol-like eclipsing binary consisting of a B star, an A star, and a two and a half day or orbit. Now, the Cherenkov telescopes, because they have very um, uh, delicate uh, electronics in many ways, the photomultiplier tubes are very sensitive to the amount of light uh, that's impacting upon them. So we have uh, a current monitor system in place which will shut off the voltage to protect the electronics in case we get too bright an illumination from either bright stars or uh, car headlights or anything like this. But we can also use it to give a, a very rough and ready photometric um, estimate of the, the amount of starlight that we're getting at the same time. So in 41 measurements over 18 nights with the, the central PMT of the current monitor, uh, we were able to actually form the light curve of this binary system where we have a, a bright central pixel when the stars are separated and dark central pixel once they're eclipsing each other um, together very well. And so this was a nice demonstration that uh, we could actually use the, Geren the, the very fast Cherenkov telescopes for doing optical astronomy. But it's perhaps not the most interesting thing uh, that we could do. Really, we were interested in having something with very, uh, <coughs> excuse me, very large mirrors, high photometric, uh, high speed uh, photometric capability. We want to do some fast uh, time variability studies here. And so for this, uh, we turn to an asteroid occultation. And so there's a prediction of a 59 kilometer diameter asteroid that will occult a 10th magnitude star, uh, essentially removing 100% of the starlight for about five seconds. And there's a 50% chance that the shadow would, would cross over Whipple Observatory. Now the nice thing about this, not only is it's a very short uh, uh, exposure uh, to do, so very quick observation that way, uh, even if there's a non-detection of the shadow and we weren't in that 50% zone, we can tell something about the size and shape of the asteroid in conjunction with uh, various uh, other astronomers uh, looking at the same phenomena that way. So it's a nice little science demonstration case to begin with. Now to resolve a star so faint actually required an upgrade to the pixel current monitor. So our normal system is called VDC mon there. And in the gray shaded area, one digital count is our limiting magnitude. And you can see that the stars, both in the Impronetta and our follow-up uh, Penelope observations, uh, would not have been resolvable that. 
so what we did was we enhanced the current monitor with uh, something we imaginatively called the Enhanced Current Monitor or ECM. And we both upgraded uh, the sensitivity and the sampling rate as well. So our VDC mon normally samples are in about one hertz. The Enhanced Current Monitor can go up to kilohertz uh, sampling rates uh, at this sort of level. And that allowed us to take a look at these stars uh, with a very high time resolution. And so what we have here is a, an animation just of the, uh, the, the star as it's going through. So we have the star in the field of view. As the asteroid crosses it, the star goes out of the way. Now, since this is 300 hertz sam sampling with a, just a 24 frame per second animation, it's not in real time, it's slowed down a lot. But it's, it's a very clear demonstration that we're getting very good photometric uh, differences between the star and the no star uh, kind of times. But if you look at the ingress and then the egress coming up, uh, there's another kind of interesting phenomena going on uh, at these very high time scales. And this is where we get to the uh, sub milli arc second are strongly part of it. So when a wave such as light gets obstructed by an object, you get a diffraction pattern from the interference of the resulting waves. So what we're essentially having here is a finite size of the star hitting an infinite wall of the asteroid and the wave-like part of the, uh, the, the, the light interferes with itself and gives us a little uh, pattern there. Now the size of the wave source affects the size of those diffraction fringes um, that we're getting uh, in, in different ways. And so we can use these to actually give us some information about the, that size of the wave source or the light source in this case. And that's what I amusingly like to call it uh, the fringe benefits of asteroid occultations. So here we zoom in onto those little sp uh, spikes that we saw at the ingress and the egress, and we see a clear diffraction pattern coming through. So even though the telescope point spread function is 0.1 degrees, and we're looking at a point-like source, the star itself uh, is not uh, a point. It still has some uh, uh, size to it. Uh, and that edge of the asteroid, even though the asteroid is fairly small, acts as an infinite edge to there. And so we get a nice diffraction pattern with the top of there showing the Impraneta and the bottom one, the uh, um, Penelope ones. The top ones at 300 hertz are sampling, the, the bottom ones at 1200 hertz. So as I said, the extent of the light source reduces the fringe. So what we can do is fit that diffraction pattern with uh, different sizes for our star estimates. And what we see is actually, um, once we get to one milli second, we would be completely geometrically resolved um, for a star at that sort of level. And for the impronetra occultation, we see that we're getting star sizes around about that 0 0.1 milli arc seconds. I think this is a really nice demonstration of uh, astronomy in, at work in, in itself, because you know, making diffraction patterns is something that you can do in an undergraduate laboratory. Astronomy, we're just making our laboratory the size of the solar system, so extending out our dimensions a little bit. But if it is such an easy experiment to like, uh, comprehend, uh, why hasn't it really been looked at before? Why are we resolving those diffraction fringes now? Well, it is something that was, was, was looked for earlier. So here we have one of the earliest uh, asteroid occultation uh, measurements taken in 1979 uh, of a star by uh, the Juno asteroid. Um, but there's a, there's a few things we need to understand with this. One is uh, at that time, there was a, a large uncertainty as to where the, the shadow path goes. So you need to be, have mobile telescopes that you can move around, very small ones. So in this case, they had two 36 uh, centimeter celestrons. Um, in order to like, uh, go out to where the, the, the shadow was going. These days, we have much better estimates of asteroid orbits. We have much better estimates of uh, star positions from things like the Gaia uh, satellite. So we've got a much better estimate of, of where things can, uh, uh, where, where the shadows are likely to go through. And that allows us to use a fixed telescope. And by having a fixed telescope, we can use a large telescope. And with these 12 meter light buckets, we can see the difference in the scintillation noise between the top measurements with the small telescopes. Um, and you, you can say that there's probably a diffraction pattern there with 50% uncertainty, but certainly the, the spread of the points in terms of the scintillation is at least the, the same, sort of, uh, same order of magnitude um, as the actual diffraction pattern itself. Whereas for the large telescopes, that scintillation noise has essentially disappeared and we get a very clean uh, signal for that um, diffraction pattern. And that's really what's allowed us to start doing these uh, impressive measurements now. So how does this compare to other direct measurements? 
And so the Chernikov telescope is actually optimal for population of small face stars. So in, in these plots, uh, we look at the, or I, I just uh, take the database of directly measured angular uh, sizes for stars, be it through interferometry or occultations. And so lunar occultations have uh, often been used uh, for this because again, you have a very accurate position for a star, you have a very accurate position for the moon, you can predict these things uh, uh, very well. But if we look at what the limiting angular resolution relates to, and there's uh, this can relate to the optical band pass, which will also act to shrink the, the fringes, how fast you sample the shadow velocity, so that's how well you can resolve the diffraction pattern itself, and the telescope aperture, which determines uh, how much of that scintillation noise that you're actually getting. Uh, the one common thing to all of these limits is the distance to the occulting object. So lunar occultations will limit you to something around about one milli arc second in size. And that gives us most stars in the 10 to 100 uh, solar radius region. But by going out to an astronomical unit or, or a few for, the, for those asteroid occultations means that we're now uh, looking at more distant stars uh, in that one to 10 uh, solar radius range. So we have a much larger population of stars that we can look at there. And because we have such large telescopes, we're looking at much fainter stars as well. And that also gives you a much larger population uh, to be able to uh, look at at any one time. So why would we be interested in the radius of small faint stars? Well, one of the uh, motivations for this is again, another field that has grown up in you know, the, the last uh, 20 years or so in terms of the transit depth of um, transiting exoplanets. Um, so by knowing the radius of the star uh, and the amount of uh, dimming in, in light as it goes across the face of that star, you get a very accurate uh, measurement of what the size of the planet is. And so we can use this, uh, these highly accurate measurements of the, of the stars to give us a, like a good uh, set of modeling parameters for understanding the population of planets. So what we did with the Impronetta and Penelope occultations was to take the uh, distance measurement uh, as provided by the, the Gaia satellite. Uh, and we can see in the gray shaded regions how much that improved between uh, the data release one and the data release two. Uh, and give, apply that to the angular size measurements that we have to give us a, an idea of what the st stellar radius is. So in the star uh, for the Impronetta occultation, our direct measurement resolved that star to be a, a supergiant around about 800 parsecs away. More interesting, perhaps, is the one for the Penelope occultation um, that we took a few months later. And so here we have uh, estimates both from the Gaia DR2 catalogue, uh, based on the effective temperatures and the luminosity of the stars, and an estimate from the Kepler K2 uh, EPIC uh, catalogue as well. And what we can see is that there's a discrepancy between those two estimates, depending on what they calculated their effective temperatures and uh, luminosities to be. And so the direct measurement by Veritas of that means we resolve that star to be a subgiant and not a main sequence star. And so if there were any uh, transiting planets around this one, that would greatly impact our, what our estimates of the, the, the size of those planets are uh, and uh, subsequently our understanding of the, uh, the planetary system in there. And there's a particular interest in K stars as well, um, since there's growing evidence of discrepancy between models and reality at around about the 5% level. And this could come down to a similar phenomenon that you see in M-dwarf modeling as well, where the structural properties of the stars in terms of their, their magnetic uh, behavior means that the radii can uh, be larger than their effective temperature values or have they have effective temperature values that are actually a little bit low for their radii. And you see this a lot uh, between systems which are measured with the uh, radius coming from binary measurements versus isolated measurements. And so a lot of the modeling for the K-stars is done on uh, binary uh, eclipses uh, and not necessarily giving you the information you need for those isolated stars, which may have uh, uh, slightly different um, uh, internal properties. So uh, just by taking the Hipparchus catalog uh, of K stars, uh, what we can see is that that population uh, maxes out around about uh, 10th to 11th um, uh, magnitude. Um, whereas most of the stars that are being measured uh, with a direct measurement uh, for those are much brighter stars um, with a limit around about uh, eighth, eighth, ninth magnitude, which is where you get the limits for both interferometers and the lunar occultation kind of level. So really you're, you're not sampling the majority of your population here. 
Whereas for those Veritas stars, so I've just summed up in the histogram uh, all the occultations we have at the moment, you see that we're sort of very much concentrated in the same maximum region uh, of the uh, stellar population uh, for those K stars. Now, the, the only issue with this is that asteroid occultations are serendipitous events. We don't get to choose which stars get occulted. We just have to sit there and, and take what, which ones that we get along. So only about one in 10 of those occultations are going to be a K star to begin with. And again, we can't just choose between whether it's a main sequence or a supergiant or subgiant or anything at that sort of level. But what we can control is the number of stars that we see potentially see occultations for just by our sensitivity limits. Um, so when the Juno occultation was performed, that's a very bright star. You maybe had one chance per year of getting some of these occultations. Uh, the stars that we were looking at um, uh, in terms of the Penelope and Impronetta occultations, uh, perhaps a few per, per, per month that way, but the sensitivity limit uh, for the Veritas telescopes with its enhanced current monitor, we should be able to get somewhere between uh, a few per month not quite one per week that way. So we can actually, um, with enough patience, build up a sufficiently large catalogue of stellar occultations, which will then give us enough K stars to give us a good estimate of the uh, a, a, a population for modelling uh, the uh, stellar sizes that way uh, reasonably well. Of course, that's just for a single fixed site. You know, for us, we're looking at maybe like between five and ten per year that way. Um, but if you have more telescopes in more sites, so we have Cherenkov telescopes, there's going to be two uh, sites for the CTA observatory, there's HESS in southern uh, Africa as well, uh, and so we can have a few of these, and they're all going to get different occultations, so we can start building up a population this way. And it's really nice as well because these sorts of campaigns can involve dozens of telescopes, so it's a great citizen science outreach opportunity at the same time. And as I say, even if you're not directly in the line, you can do a lot of the um, asteroid astronomy at the same time in terms of determining what the size and shape of those asteroids uh, actually is. But it's not just limited to Cherenkov telescopes uh, in this way. So in January of this year, we were able to use the fast camera ultraspec on the Thai National Telescope, and we can also resolve the different diffraction patterns uh, on these. And so with the uh, enhanced Gaia catalogues and the better knowledge of the asteroid or orbits, uh, we're actually able to start looking at these on a number of telescopes around the world. And so you can actually rapidly, uh, with enough telescopes, start to look uh, uh, for enough of these to get us like a, a good modeling population to begin with. And this is because the limiting angular resolution, a Cherenkov telescope's in some ways a little bit of an overkill uh, for doing this sort of science. It's fantastic for lowering that scintillation noise down, uh, but if we look in what the actual limits are in terms of optical bandpass, shadow velocity, uh, and telescope aperture, uh, so optical bandpass is the blue shaded regions here, uh, the uh, sampling rate, the green shaded areas, uh, and the grey is the telescope aperture. Uh, and then the red dashed line is the Fresnel limit. So that's the, the limit where you can't tell the difference between a point-like source and um, an extended source uh, in, in the diffraction pattern there. What you see is actually the optical band pass is the limiting um, uh, value there. And so even going further out from the asteroid belt uh, to Kuiper belt objects, you might be able to get a factor of two uh, or a few in terms of the limiting uh, resolution that you, you want to go to. But as long as your telescope uh, isn't uh, overly uh, concerned in terms of the scintillation noise that it's getting and has very good uh, optical band pass, so you're getting an almost monochromatic line that, that sort of way. You can do some interesting things with these asteroid occultations. Okay. But as I said, the, the down point of, the, to this is it's still based on serendipity, so you can't choose what uh, sort of source uh, or target that you want to look at. So here we've been looking at intensity interferometry instead. So it's changing gears a little bit, but it's still looking at sub milli second science. So I need to introduce a little bit of theory as to what we're doing here. So what we have, in essence, is not really an interferometer. It's just called interferometry because Michelson interferometry started uh, before that in the 1930s. And because we're probing similar scales, uh, the uh, Henry Brown and Twist, when they came up with the idea, wanted to like, uh, associate it with in interferometry. So they called it intensity interferometry instead of amplitude interferometry, uh, as Michelson interferometry was. But really what we're doing is uh, correlating fluctuations. So we have an extended body of an angular diameter, theta, and that consists of many incoherently emitting sources that produce a speckled pattern at the observer, the typical size about the, the wavelength divided by that angular diameter. 
Now, if you have a pair of observers, so different telescopes, separated by a distance which is smaller than that uh, inherent uh, speckle pattern size, you're in the same speckle, and therefore you expect to see the same or similar intensity fluctuations. If you extend further out uh, to over the separation of that speckle size, you should be in different speckles, and there should be less or preferably no correlation between those. And so the point where the correlation uh, becomes, well, the signal essentially becomes decorrelated, gives you a measure of the angular size of that emission region. And the baseline of separation that you have between those telescopes, between those different observers, uh, will give you uh, different characteristic scales that you can probe. Now, there's a whole rabbit hole that we can go down in terms of like looking at the science behind this, but because it's a colloquium and we have limited time across along there, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version instead. So our signal is basically just that intensity fluctuation correlation for non-independent beams of the, of the light. And so we call that the partial coherence function uh, in that gamma one, two. And because we're looking at the intensity, it's a squared signal uh, from that. Now, the difficulty with this is that enhancement is very, very small. It's maybe one, again, one in 10,000 photons will be correlated between your two detectors. So you need really good photon statistics for this. So if we look at the signal to noise equation at the bottom of there, one way you get this is by having, by only being able to look at hot bright sources where there's a large number of photons in a very small amount of space generated uh, to begin with. The next thing you need is large mirror surfaces to collect as many of those photons as you can get. You need very fast detectors uh, so that you're not averaging out over like many of the timescales. But one of the benefits of this is that you're no longer having to interfere something at a fraction of a wavelength. So your co coherence length, or actually your coherence time in this case, is quite large. We're looking at something around about the scale of a nanosecond, which is you know, 30, nan 30 centimeters in size. So again, once again, we're actually immune to that atmospheric scintillation path length, which can be such a limiting factor of the amplitude interferometers. And it also means that we can extend things down to the blue end of the optical spectrum. So we're looking at a slightly different part uh, of the optical spectrum as well. But again, with that 30 centimeter path length uh, difference, you can use some quite crude optics and become very expensive, uh, but, but are acceptable. So the upshot is you have inexpensive telescopes to do this interferometry in the blue end of the spectrum. So as long as you have large mirrors and reasonably good quantum efficiency on your detectors. So as I said, this was a, a technique pioneered by Hambry Brown and Twiss in the 1950s, culminating in the narrow Bryce stellar intensity interferometry that operated through uh, the 1960s into the 1970s, which were two six and a half meter dishes on 188 meter diameter circular track in order to like, uh, preserve the baselines as they followed uh, a target through the sky. Now it's a large mirror surface with simple optics and if you think it looks a little bit like a Cherenkov telescope, it won't surprise you that once the intensity interferometer portion uh, finished, they did actually go on to use it as one of the very early pioneer Cherenkov telescopes in the 1970s as well. But for the, uh, uh, for the NSI part, uh, portion of it, they were able to measure the angular diameter of 32 stars. It's actually one of the first catalogues of direct measurements of stars was ever made. Um, because it had to be bright sources, it's uh, only down to a third magnitude. And so it's been overtaken a little bit by the amplitude interferometers there. Uh, and so once they reached their magnitude limit in 1974, the amplitude interferometers uh, took over again. So even though that had reached its limit in the 1930s, technology had moved on enough that they were able to start going through there. They also did a few other things on particularly interesting sources, such as measuring the limb darkening, doing some work on spectroscopic binaries, and also emission line regions. But in the same way that Michelson interferometry reached a limit in the 1930s and had to wait for technology to catch up to it in the 1980s. Narrabri intensity interferometer reached a technology limit in the 1970s. Jump forward, you know, 40, 50 years, and we get to the stellar intensity interferometry at Veritas. The technology has moved on enough that we can start looking at doing these sorts of things again. So we equipped the Veritas telescopes beginning in October 2018, going up to four telescope observations in December of last year, uh, to measure photon intensity at each telescope with a continuous digitization. And the important thing is that this is digitizing at the telescope directly to disk and the correlation is performed offline the next day. And so we have a goal to image 30 nearby stars in the UV band uh, and we're using uh, bright time. So around about plus or minus two days around the full moon, which is when we're not normally performing gamma ray observations. The, the moon gives us too much uh, light in terms of the night sky background to be able to observe these gamma ray showers. So it's, it's, it's fallow time for the telescopes 
But this isn't a problem for bright sources uh, with a sufficiently narrow band filter. And so we use a very narrow band filter uh, on a central PMT uh, for doing these observations. So our data is taken in 20 minute runs. As I say, it's streamed to disk at 250 mega samples per second. And it's correlated offline the next day. And this is very important as well. So as another difference to the amplitude interferometers where you're directly interfering uh, the light beams from telescopes, there's only so many times you can cut that beam up between different telescopes. We can almost infinitely expand our array of telescopes by recording to disk and just having a fast network uh, to transfer the data between them. As the data is in 20 min uh, minute runs, our, our telescopes are doing this like an aperture synthesis as well. So we're changing the baseline um, as the telescope moves through the sky. So we don't have to move our telescopes on those circular tracks as they did in Narrabri either. We just need to uh, follow the source through the sky and that gives us more samples along our visibility curve. So our first results um, for two stars here. So we've got um, uh, Beta Canis Major and Epsilon Orion. And what we have in the top plots is you see the correlation function uh, as a function of delay uh, uh, between the two things. And those should peak at zero uh, for our, a certain baseline. And for each of those baselines, as the baselines get larger, you see the correlation function reduces. So when we project, uh, plot the projected baseline as a function of the correlation parameter, we can then fit that curve uh, with a function which describes uh, the uniform disk equivalent uh, for that stellar size. And so what do we get for these two stars? So if we compare them uh, in five hour observations uh, for Veritas, compare those to the Narrabri instrument uh, needing something of order of about 60 hours. So a factor of 10 lower uh, observation time, we get a factor two better estimate of what those uh, stellar diameters actually are um, at this sub milli arc second um, level. And so it, that shows just how much the technology has actually been able to move on in, in the same level. And by having those four telescopes, we can mul sample multiple baselines at the same time. So we don't have to it's like, uh, also reduce our uh, observing time uh, in, that sort of, in that way. Now there's a lot of science that we can uh, look for, uh, but there's only a short space of time to actually cover it um, in here. So I encourage people to look at some of the uh, references that I put up um, on here. Uh, we've also got a couple of um, papers that went into the recent uh, Astro 2020 uh, decade of review, uh, which uh, gives more links to the, the, the science that we're looking at. But the first dimension that we can look at is the angular size of the stars, assuming a uniform disk. And so we've got the correlation plot uh, with the correlation as a function of baseline. And the larger the baselines, the smaller the detail that we can see. Uh, so for something around about uh, 10 million arc seconds, that's around about uh, 10 meters in size, one million arc seconds, you need something 100 meters in size, 0.1 million arc seconds, you need something going out to about um, 1,000 meters in size in this sort of way. And so what we're doing now when we plot uh, the stars that we're looking at in terms of the very stellar intensity deformatory and the asteroid occultation, we're now filling out what uh, for the narrow bri was either very close stars to get those main sequence ones to very large stars going slightly further out. We're able to get much further out stars, much fainter stars as well, because we're uh, sampling uh, uh, our observations, our signal noise is getting uh, better by a factor of 10 there. The, again, that one solar to 10 solar radius uh, region. But also, the longer the baseline, the more sensitive the observations that we have, the more that we can do in terms of accurately constraining the, the, the model. It's not just that 1D parameter for the uniform disk anymore. Stars aren't like that. They have limb darkening, so they're, they're darker towards the edge as you've got sort of larger optical depth as you look there. Now, in the first part of the correlation curve, it's hard to break the degeneracy between what is a uniform disk and what is a limb darkened disk. But for the second part, so for the second peak in the curve, uh, that degeneracy is broken. That's giving you 2D information about the star in itself. And so what the dark blue region is perhaps uh, now a five hour observation, what was a 50 hour observation for Narrabri, the uh, lighter blue region is a 50 hour observation for us, um, which would have been far too long for uh, doing with uh, narrow bright beforehand. So we can actually get the limb darkening performance there. And that allows us to accurately constrain uh, evolution models and, in a model independent way. And it allows us to get better er error estimates for what the actual uh, stellar limb darkening parameter is. And that will more accurately determine the size of transiting exoplanets. So for what we see in the um, middle and the right plots here, are 
without and with limb darkening respectively and how that affects what the transit uh, light curve looks like for an exoplanet there. So by having that extra sensitivity, we're now able to break that degeneracy and give far more accurate estimates for uh, transiting exoplanet uh, sizes there. But it's not just um, a uniform disk or a limb darkened disk uh, that we're looking at. Rapidly rotating stars as well, particularly from uh, these bright uh, energetic uh, systems, will distort the shape um, of a star. And you also get gravitational darkening from this. Uh, and that feeds into things like uh, forming uh, BE star disks, uh, winds coming off of hot stars, and the wolf ray at, at star environments, or the precursors to GRBs. Now, on Narrabri, we're able to get a reasonably good estimate uh, for Altair, uh, just seeing how the position angle changed as a function of time uh, with two telescopes, but it just gives you an impression of what the, uh, we're actually doing here. With the amplitude interferometers of Chara and six telescopes, we're actually starting to build a picture of what the shape of the star is. And the interesting thing with this one is that the difference between the Chara observation and the standard theoretical model shows that there was stronger darkening along the equator. So, which was inconsistent with the standard von Zeipel light gravity darkening prescription, assuming uniform rotation. And I think this gives an idea of what the power is of being able to provide data to fit a model to, rather than just having a model uh, that the, you then see how well it fits your data in this sort of way. So you're actually starting to drive the understanding of the stellar environment in this way. And this is what you get with more telescopes. And again, uh, with more sensitive uh, instruments, uh, you're looking at dynamic systems as well. And so a time average correlation provides some information, but if you get a time sequence of, uh, or a series of images, and so as the orbit changes for a binary system, or if you have um, st stellar spots, so hot and dark regions going across the face of a star, you need something which is m working on uh, much higher time scales, much faster time scales. So these five hour observations will be able to give you an impression of this, where it would be just uniformly blurred in a 50 hour observation. And so for those requirements, you need many baselines over 100 meters and many baselines measuring simultaneously for much shorter observation times there. And this is where we get to in terms of the future and CTA. Um, so Veritas, we have four telescopes, but for CTA in the north, we have um, 19 telescopes of uh, split between 23 and 12 meter uh, diameters. And for the su southern array, nearly 100 telescopes in the uh, the final array uh, configuration, uh, which introduce uh, also another 70 uh, small size telescopes going out to kilometer baseline scales. And with so many available baselines, so for something like Veritas, where you might have 10 baselines um, sampling the UV plane, with 100, you get thousands of simultaneous measurements along there. And you're able to get those model independent imaging uh, becomes a realistic possibility. So just to give you an idea of what this would uh, uh, look like, potentially. Uh, more than one dimension comes from imaging with optical ap aperture synth synthesis. So we're sort tracking the source through the sky to increase the number of available baselines on top of uh, the, the large number of baselines that we already have. So we're getting a really dense coverage of that Fourier uh, plane, um, the, the UV plane. If we sample more of that, we're able to get reverse that Fourier transform and get uh, an observed image back. Now it's not going to be an ideal one, and certainly for intensity interferometry, because we're measuring the square of the visibility, we lose the phase information. And so we lose the ability to tell which way is up, essentially in an image, but there are ways to recover this. But in the next few slides, I just want to show you what we would do in terms of the FFT sampling. And so this is just the FFT sampling effects only. There's gonna be you know, lots more caveats in terms of the signal to noise that, that we're getting. But in terms of the Veritas spacing, it's okay for large stru structure, but not necessarily for fine details. So an eight hour observation of Veritas for a so something on the region between one and 10 milliard seconds, so a giant solar-like star, um, and around about 20 degree uh, declination. So for this, just took uh, an image of the sun and scaled it until it's three and a half milliard seconds um, in size for the, the diameter across. With those four baselines for Veritas, we don't get much of the FFT plane, but we get enough to get an impression of there's something interesting happening on that surface. But most stars, as I said, are less than one milliard second. And an interferometer is essentially blind to any scale that does not have that baseline measurement. So we're not really going to get even that impression uh, to, to begin with. What we need is something with much larger uh, baselines. So for CTA telescopes going over to several hundred meters for that same star, but this time at a one milliard second sort of size, 
again, we get back to that impressionistic image. We know that something's going on in the surface and we can move it all the way through there. If we imagine ourselves going to something even larger in terms of the small scale, small size telescopes with 70 telescopes spread up to a, like a kilometer kind of baseline, then we would be able to, under us like ideal circumstances, get down to those levels where we can individually count those stellar spots on that sur uh, surface. Uh, and I think that's a very exciting future uh, that's going to come along uh, very soon. So in summary, uh, Cherenkov telescopes are surprisingly, or I hope not surprisingly anymore, really good op optical telescopes when it comes to photometry. That large mirror surface means there's low scintillation and sharp noise, and that makes for very good high time resolution for optometry. And we've demonstrated this through sub, sub milliard second angular scale resolution, uh, both through uh, looking at the diffraction pattern uh, in asteroid occultations of stars and as uh, an optical intensity diffraumeter with a system that can be scaled up to an arbitrary number of telescopes with simple uh, commercial fiber optics. Now, each one of the uh, methods that I showed has certain pros and certain cons. Asteroid occultation, you're looking at something which is serendipitous, whereas intensity diffraumetry, you can choose your targets within reason. Uh, intensity diffraumetry unfortunately requires hot bright targets, whereas asteroid occultation isn't limited to that sort of thing, so you can actually start looking at faint and cool targets. So it's nice to see that these things are supporting each other in different ways and making up for the deficiencies uh, of each of the other one. But if I want to leave you with one impression at the end of this talk, how does a Cherenkov telescope compare? So on this one, we plot the angular resolution as a function of wavelength for a number of facilities. Cherenkov telescope point spread function starts off around about 0 0.1 degrees. With the intensity interferometry, where with Veritas, we're looking at the uh, baselines around about that sub milliard second level, equivalent of a 100 meter telescope, uh, shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum compared to the amplitude interferometers, such as Chara and VLTI, and very similar to the lunar occultations. Uh, and CTA will then extend that further down to the same similar sorts of uh, levels that we're looking at for the asteroid occultations for a thousand meter telescope, really being able to resolve uh, stellar surfaces for the first time and giving us an angular resolution equivalent to continental uh, baseline interferometry in the radio. And, that's what I'll have. and I'll open up for questions at that point. Thank you, Michael. Um, looks like Charles has a question. Um, okay, can you hear me? We can, Charles. Okay, um, so thank you. This is actually really very interesting. I'm wondering what is the primary limiting um, factor in how many occultations you can do? Is it the number of asteroids or is it the astrometry and the asteroids that are known? Um, so uh, a part of it's in the astron astrometry of the, of the asteroids that are known. Um, even with the better estimates for the Gaia positions, um, if, you if you extrapolate the asteroid orbit by more than one or two months, uh, then you can get drastically varying estimates in terms of the probability of the um, uh, shadow going overhead. Um, and so that's going to depend a little bit on the, the, the size of the asteroid. So very large asteroids would usually have very good uh, uh, estimates of what their orbits are, are doing. And so we can predict them uh, quite large uh, time in, 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 in the future, but there's very few of those. Uh, there's much more uh, smaller asteroids. And so I think once we get the astrometry of the smaller asteroids very well known, that's going to allow us to predict these things, you know, going from a, a month in advance to just like a year in advance. Um, and that, that would make a, a very large difference between which ones we would target and which ones we wouldn't target. Mm -hmm. But as we're talking about observations that take five minutes or less, to actually do, it's not a, a very large burden on uh, any uh, observing program, um, unless you have to change the instrument. So how small can you go down the asteroid size spectrum in principle? Uh, in, in principle, um, so we're looking at uh, potentially for Kuiper belt objects, we would be able to, if uh, for something the size of about 100 meters, mm -hmm. um, we might even be able to get uh, two or three of those uh, in a 10 hour period. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't know when those are happening. Um, for the asteroids in the main asteroid belt, we're probably talking something around about a, a few kilometers in size, just to be able to have a telescope that can measure what the orbit's doing, uh, and then give us that information back. That way. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure who this next question is from. It's TKS. Yep, there you go. Um, uh, you're on mute. I see if I can unmute you. Um, I cannot. Um, oh, there I you go. I unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, uh, thanks for an excellent talk. That's that's wonderful. I have a couple of questions on the intensity and parameter. Now, it seems to me that you can arbitrarily increase the baselines here, right? I mean, unlike in uh, amplitude and spirometry, you can go to the really huge baseline. So where does the limit come from? Is there a limit? Uh, in theory, there's no limit to the size of baseline that you could go to. Um, there's even been a proposal to put uh, a telescope on the moon and use uh, an earth moon baseline to start looking for um, uh, exoplanet um, level uh, features. The main difficulty though is uh, requiring these very uh, large numbers of photons at source. You need a, a high uh, photon uh, spectral density. And so you need very hot regions. And so mm -hmm. there's usually a limit to the size that you could get one of those. Um, and so it, it, it's a, a source intrinsic effect. So a transiting exoplanet probably wouldn't have enough, to be generating enough photons to be a useful uh, measurement on the, the, the Earth Moon um, baseline, unless you had very, very efficient um, quantum efficiency in terms of your, your detector there. So really it's, it's, it's how much matter you can pack into a small area and generate very high kind of you know, temperatures of, of black body temperatures uh, over 10,000 degrees. And so that, that, that would be the ultimate limit. Uh, Thank you. Uh, if I may ask another question, I would, otherwise I'll wait. Uh, go for it. Okay. Uh, my next question is, you know, what is the uh, balance or the trade-off point between uh, um, intensity interferometry and amplitude interferometry? Now, there are multiple factors here. Uh, so is there something you can say about it? I, I think that the nicest part about it is that they're complementary in, in many ways. So amplitude interferometry is more suited uh, quite often to uh, cooler objects uh, that we wouldn't be able to look at in terms of the intensity interferometry, uh, which means it's also concentrated more towards the red end of the spectrum. Uh, being in the blue, if we were to look at um, a system in emission lines, for instance, we would be probing to uh, different optical depths. So by having a combined amplitude interferometer and intensity interferometer, you could potentially generate a 3D picture of um, a stellar system uh, in, in many ways. And so, and so I, I think that the benefit is that the, we're looking at slightly different objects or slightly different regions um, uh, between the two of them. Thank you. Uh, I have a, another comment too, if there is no one else wanting to ask. Uh, There's, um, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I've got a couple, but I'm trying to keep it. So why don't you yeah, go okay. for it? Uh, 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 here, um, how about uh, Josh? We hear from Josh I'm next, and then. Yes, very, very nice talk, Michael. Um, and let me just mention, it was a real uh, thrill to work with Hanbury Brown to convert his intensity interferometer into our Cherenkov experiments where we detected SNA. Oh yes, yes. yes. But uh, let me let me ask my question here. Did have you looked uh, at Betel, Betelgeuse during its dimming episode, even though it's a very red star, of course? But uh, did you do that? And if so, did you provide new insights into the size of the spot that we've seen images of? I guess from Chara, I'm not sure, or from HST. Andrea has been involved with that. Or more interesting, uh, at least for some things I've been thinking about, did you see any changes in, in radius as yeah. the star dimmed or came returned to you know normal, shall we call it? So lots of questions there, but if you can answer any of those, that would be great to hear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Be Betelgeuse was a, a very interesting thing and it came along at the, at the right time. The yeah. unfortunate thing about it is that it's actually too large. Uh -huh. um, and so the 100 meter separation that, that, that we have, yeah. Betelgeuse is kind of more towards the 10 milliarc second kind of scale than yeah. and, and 10 meters. And so because the interferometers blind on those scales, um, it, it would be an unresolved source for us. So it would be, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a double whammy. One, it's a little bit too cool for the sorts of things that we mm -hmm. want to be doing for intensity interferometry. 
<laughs> and unfortunately it's too big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too bad, yep. All right, uh, Ramesh is next. We can Great, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I have unmuted myself, thank you. So you mentioned that you have ways of uh, measuring visibility phases. Could you say a little bit about how that works? So, so it, uh, well, the, 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 there are two ways that we can go about it. One is um, just through normal image processing techniques where you provide an, an, an estimate of what you expect the phase to be and generate images from that and, and, and fit to a model. So it's more of a phase recovery than a phase estimation. Um, but at the same time, if you have three telescopes, you, you've got to close your loop. And so uh, even though in the second order correlation between two telescopes, you lose that phase information, the third order and higher order um, information between correlations of, of uh, more than two telescopes or so three telescope correlations, you can theoretically um, get the phase information back from that as well. Um, now that again requires going to very high photon statistics and it, it's something which is on our to-do list. It's, it's not something we've achieved um, quite yet, uh, but it's definitely something we're interested in doing in the near future. Mm -hmm. And particularly with CTA, when you can measure um, many baselines simultaneously at, at the same level, uh, and you, you can do those third order correlations, um, we, we should be able to get some very interesting uh, results getting that phase information back that way. Yeah, thanks. I thought you were going to say closure. So my question would be, how much, uh, I mean, the signal to noise, how much brighter does your source have to be for you to be able to do this uh, closure, a, a way of doing phase estimates? So, uh, so for something like, um, a 12 meter telescope, we would expect for the 1D information, uh, a magnitude limit around about sixth to seventh magnitude. Uh, to be able to do closure, we probably need to be um, somewhere, we, we, that, that would bring that sensitivity li limit up to maybe somewhere between second and third magnitude again. So we'd probably have fairly similar limits to what the original narrow bright instrument had, but being able to do imaging rather than just the 1D uh, uh, measurement, uh, that sort of sort of way. Great, thank you. Uh, David Phillips. <clears throat> I didn't have a question, sorry. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, all right, uh, we had the original or second questioner, uh, TK, I, yep. Uh, yeah, ah, uh, oh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I just wanted to point out that uh, that this higher order correlation that you are using in the intensity intrometer is the boson uh, bunching fluctuation, right? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, this indeed is the is a source of noise for radio astronomers like me. You know, the this is what constitutes our noise. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I believe um, is is isn't that right? So yes, yes, yeah. Uh, so so it yeah, it's 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 one of those things which uh, <laughs> what was it uh, what, one of those uh, sources and another poison site type thing in that uh, yeah it it's very much reliant on the um, underlying statistics of the photon stream coming through uh, in this sort of way um, yeah. and so we're reliant on a chaotic system with photon bunching mm -hmm. occurring. Um, so, but. That can also be uh, an advantage in some ways. So one of the things that we might want to look at uh, is if there are like uh, optical equivalents of mazes. And so if we have a lasing uh, uh, situation, we wouldn't get the same intensity inter interferometry correlation mm. uh, mm. from the statistics that way. Uh, so we, we, we could actually use a, a difference in our expected signal to uh, find out something about the underlying um, population statistics. And we can use that to uh, probe a different uh, ele electron or proton or indeed uh, photon um, uh, underlying populations in that sort of way at the same time. Okay. So, uh, do, sorry, does it mean that uh, in, in, in scattering that you would expect a different kind of behavior uh, with the intensity interferometer? Like, are you able to do more with a uh, scattering situation? Uh, pr provided there's a sufficient polarization signal that we would then capture. Um, and so if we put polarizing filters and, and looked at the, in, in, at the different um, uh, phases along the polarization, we, we could look at the scattering in the atmosphere, uh, particularly electron scattering. Um, uh, and, and so that's one of the 
uh, things that is being looked at for, for CTA, uh, but you would need that dense uh, uh, coverage of the UV plane to, to get that level. Thank you. Uh, Charles, you have your hand up again. I do, just, I have a very simple question. So the focal plane for Veritas was chosen um, um, for its primary function, which was uh, Cherenkov detection. If you were to re-equip the focal plane for these purposes, would you make a significant change? Uh, but potentially, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, we only need a single pixel for the intensity interferometry, uh, well, indeed in, for the asteroid occultations. Um, uh, for the, I mean, the asteroid occultations, it's just uh, a simple DC monitor. So it just depends what the resolution of your uh, data sampler is uh, for that. For the intensity interferometry, because we need to keep um, correlated noise levels down, you would probably need to put in uh, an independent uh, data acquisition uh, channel with very so, so lots of shielded cables. Uh, but if it's all maintained in the central pixel on, on, on the focal plane, um, it would make things a lot easier. At the moment, we just take a plate with a mirror and reflect onto our own uh, detector. But uh, if, yeah, if it's contained within the camera, there's no instrument changeover needed at that point. And, and that would make things a lot simpler for going between things. All right, I see uh, Jessica. Hi, yeah. This brought back great memories of things I did 40 years ago with Jim Elliott um, modeling lunar occultations um, uh -huh. using the diffraction pattern. And there was actually one wonderful night when I was observing at two wavelengths simultaneously um, a, an Aldebaran occultation at Oak Ridge with oh, Leo Goldberg. Nice. And um, we had the one problem we have observing in the Northeast is weather. And a cloud came in just before the immersion and it disappeared just, um, just after the immersion. So we didn't get any of it. Uh, yes, it yeah. we, cool we expect to lose our, about 50% of ours due to weather. Yeah, Because Aldebaran is big enough that we could actually, we, we could resolve it pretty well. I, I wrote all the code to do the analysis. So it's, it was really interesting to watch what we were doing. We were doing millisecond timing and uh, a 60, it's a 1.5 meter. Oh, excellent, yes. So it, was just, it was just interesting to see where things are going with this. Um, yes, no, I mean, we, we, we've, we've taken a lot of our understanding of the modeling of the asteroid occultation from the work of, of the lunar occultation. Um, and, and, and so that's been invaluable for being able to get to where we are at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. well, anyway, thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. So. All right, so I'll, I'll take a chance to ask a question and it's a leading question, of course. Um, so, you know, we, we planned on taking about 700 hours a year of the intensity interferometry observations, you know, and obviously that's an ideal case if we get all the time that's available to us. Um, and assuming we can do this for the next five years and maybe we get the upgrade that, you know, Dave is putting into NSF uh, this winter, you know, that's, you know, on the order of 3000 hours, um, what sort of a big picture product that we get out of this? A catalog that rival, you know, obviously exceeds Narabri. Um, you want to comment on what maybe we put out? Um, uh, so, so certainly, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things is, so the, the, the limiting magnitude for the Narabri catalog was third magnitude uh, in, in terms of the stars. Uh, for Veritas, we're hoping somewhere between sixth and seventh magnitude. And, and so that will give us uh, an order of magnitude in the number of stars that we can actually at least uh, provide measurements um, uh, for, um, but obviously once you have that measurement, uh, there's not necessarily much more that you would want to be able to do with it. But because we've got very, um, uh, a much faster uh, detector um, than they had there as well, we can look at some of the time varying uh, kind of um, aspects. Mm -hmm. so we should be able to do binary systems and keep monitoring those uh, and also start looking uh, at the emission lines in, in regions around BE stars and disks. And so look at um, systems that won't necessarily be static in time. Uh, and so even, even though you might like think, okay, we, we, we reach the sensitivity limit uh, in five years, uh, there's still uh, a time resolution limit um, uh, for these time varying uh, targets that would uh, provide some very interesting science uh, for, for, for many years to come. Um, there's the, the 2D information, so you need deeper exposures to get that limb darkening uh, coefficient, and so we should be able to get that uh, on a lot more of the targets. Um, so where Narrabri got one of those, we might possibly be able to get up to 30 
uh, stars that sort of way so we'll be able to increase our statistics and our knowledge of, of the, the stellar evolution uh, that sort of way uh, and then we can do a lot of uh, the pioneering uh, development work for the CTA um, instrument as well where we then go from having those uh, four telescopes 10 baselines up to you know several thousand baselines uh, and much smaller features uh, at, the, at the same time. Right, thank you. All right. Um, well, I, I don't see any more hands. Um, I thought we've had a very enthusiastic discussion as well, which reflects on a great talk, Michael. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if it's my job to thank everybody for attending or if it's Randall's or- it, it, um, It's both of ours and, and thanks again, Michael. It was, it was indeed a great talk. Thank you, yeah, yeah. And if anyone has questions, please you know, feel free to email me and yeah, we can 